What's up, guys? It's Coach Gaglione here. This is another edition of the Powerlifting for the People podcast. We got a special guest here today, uh, Mary. How you doing? Good. Morning? How about you? All right. So we got uh, so Mary Hodge. Uh, we just recently kind of uh, connected. Uh, we had our first power up powerlifting camp. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about that today. But just really quickly for the people that are listening or watching, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you got going on right now. Sure, so I'm Mary Hodge. I'm the High Performance Manager for U.S. Paralympic Powerlifting. We call it para because the word Paralympic is owned. Um, I've been doing this probably over 20 years. I've gone to four Paralympic Games, Sydney, Australia, Athens, Greece, London, and Beijing, China. Um, and I've reversed those. <laughs> uh, the Paralympics are always in the same venue as the Olympics, always within a three-week period after the Olympics. I've coached world championships, regional championships. Um, I love working with athletes with disabilities. They are elite athletes, and they have to have a physical disability. So I just want to uh, get just a couple of quick questions, just clarifying a couple like terms and stuff, and then I also want to rewind a little bit and just talk about how you actually got into all this. But so, what is the like the title? Like, what is high performance manager? What does that actually mean? And what's like kind of your role? In, like, I do everything, this? including cleaning the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> all joking aside, uh, my role is to expand the sport across the country. Um, looking for athletes, coaches, and referees. That's my that's my primary role. My secondary role is to set the standards for our elite athletes. So to make Team USA, you have to hit a certain, as we call MQS, minimum qualifying standard. The International Federation has a standard. Our standards are much higher because what are ultimately the Olympic and the Paralympic Committee want to see are podium potential athletes. So it is my job then to drive that standard and ensure that our coaches are training our athletes to get on the podium. Great. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to also kind of ask you about, and we'll get into like the actual kind of track toward getting to the, the games and everything, but um, so a lot of people that are listening that, like from, from our channel, uh, you know, they, when they think of powerlifting, uh, like in like gen general terms, they're thinking squat, bench, deadlift uh, with the straight board. There's obviously many different federations. So what, what are some of the differences between Power, power lifting, like as far as like you know the actual events, the what exercise is being contested, and so can you just tell us a little bit? So about that? in relation to the Paralympic world and the Olympic world, there are 23 sports, summer sports. Every sport, with the exception of goalball and bocce, are mimicked after the able-bodied sport. So in para powerlifting, we mimic after USA weightlifting or weightlifting in general. In weightlifting, as you said, there are the three different events. In powerlifting, we only have the bench because we have athletes of various and sundry disabilities such as dwarf cerebral palsy, uh, MS, MD, uh, spina bifida. So you have an athlete in a wheelchair, you have an, uh, a a uh, short statured athlete, you have an athlete with crutches. Those athletes all have to be made to be on the same playing field to bench. So how we do that, or how the Federation does it, is by having everybody lift their legs off the floor. So any athlete, no matter who they are, whether they're a stander or in a wheelchair, a wheelchair user, um, has to lay down on a bench with their legs up, and then that creates the same playing field based on body weight class and sex, of course. Great. Yeah, so I know, uh, like I said, I've been involved in, you know, powerlifting for 12 years and uh, I remember uh, I actually spoke with Caitlin uh, yesterday which uh, we had a great great conversation um, I remember seeing I've seen some like videos here and there but I noticed that especially like on social and the internet and stuff a lot of times like uh, the word you know it's not always clear uh, like the you know as far as power the, the words weren't always used you might see like a video of someone bench pressing uh, the bench is a little bit different so what are like some of the, I know like the equipment's a little bit different some like sure. the rules so what are some of the other like kind so of differences? So basically our bench is longer by about three feet than an able-bodied bench we call it an AB bench and it's also wider that then accommodates the athlete that has to put their legs up so as an example we have someone in 107 plus we actually have two male athletes in 107 plus one of our male athletes is, is coming in at over 350 pounds of body weight. That person is not gonna lift on a small bench like this and be able to put his legs up. Yeah, if they're just not gonna fit. Right. Yeah. Um, he has a spinal cord injury. Our other athlete in 107 plus has a, a below the knee amputation. So clearly he can bench on an able-bodied bench, but that's not the sport. So basically in the end, what it does is it takes out everything from your hips down. So it truly is a contest of upper body strength. Great. And I know, uh, and maybe if you want to talk about it a little bit, I know like some some of the athletes they make, they strap in and stuff. Uh, I know like so in a lot of federations, there's uh, some different commands. 
Uh, I know in Tara, there's no like actually press command, but there's start commands, there's rack commands. Are there any other differences in like the rules? So the bar is 45 like pounds. Typically, the current leader in equipment is Alika, which is similar to able bodied. Um, as I said, the bench is longer and wider. The bar is 45 pounds. Uh, when the bar is taken out of the rack, you get a start command. Uh, the referees wait for the bar to be completely motionless before the athlete can move. They have to hold it in, in out of the rack, motionless. The ref will say start, they bring the bar down, they must hold it completely motionless on their chest. Um, now the way the rule reads is it's a stop in motion. So for athletes in the smaller body weight classes, the referees look for a distinct stop. No pause, no uh, dump, no bump, no yeah. <laughs> none of that, no bounce. Um, for the heavier weights, they can kind of get away with a real short stop and go. And then you ascend up and you wait until you hear rack before you move. Great. Yeah, so some of the, a lot of the, you know, the rules are similar, but there are some, there are definitely some differences. And that was one thing, you know, we had a clinic here, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And, you know, it was definitely a very eye-opening and kind of learned a lot. Um, and especially for someone that's really completely new to uh, the actual, the sport of the, the bench press versus just kind of lift, you know, kind of bro lifting in the commercial gym. Right. Uh, you may be able to think, oh, I, I could put up, you know, 300 pounds or 400 pounds. And then with commands, with a certain standard. Yes. That, that number changes I think pretty, the stop pretty, pretty, pretty on the chest pretty much yeah. is really at the stop without bouncing or uh, descending in is really what makes the Separates difference in an athlete. Um, let's just put it this way. The strongest man in an able-bodied sport is the highest body weight and who lifts the most. In para powerlifting, the strongest man is from um, Iran. His name is Raman, uh, mm -hmm. Simon, Raman actually. And he is benching over 608 pounds currently with a complete stop on his chest. Yeah. So that just shows you the eliteness of these athletes. It's really impressive to watch. And I know a lot, some, a lot of the athletes, you know, sometimes they'll actually even take the bar out themselves. Yes. Uh, they're really showing, and I know like with the judges, and I think, you know, in both sports, uh, you know, whether it be the power powerlifting or uh, what you guys may know as, you know, traditional like kind of power powerlifting for able body lifters, um, that, that showing that control and showing that stop and really kind of, you know, making sure that you're in control of the weight makes Absolutely. can make a big difference. So Absolutely. very cool. Yeah. So I, I know you've been doing this for a long time, so I want to kind of rewind a little bit and get back. Um, so I know we, we are actually certified through the same uh, kind of governing body, right. <laughs> which is cool. So that's how kind of how we connected and met, and, you know, always trying to learn and get better. And even though we've both been doing this a long time, uh, you know, over, you know, de over a decade, uh, how did you get started in just training people, getting into personal training? What made you kind of decide that path? And so my full-time job is cerebral palsy NASA. Um, and so I work with persons with disabilities. And what happened is I started a team, a local team, because what I found is athletes that are severely physically disabled tend to be overlooked when it comes to sport. Um, I'm a sport person. I love sport. I've always loved sport. I love football. Uh, I play sport not as well as I coach it. <laughs> um, and so a gentleman came up to me when I was probably 22 or 23 years old and said to me, hey, can you teach me how to bench press? And the gentleman happened to be in a wheelchair. And in my very um, unknowledgeable and silly behavior, I said to him, you absolutely cannot bench press. And so he so looked at me. disregarded it. Yeah. yeah. He looked at me. He said, I'll bring you a videotape. And so to date myself a little bit, since John already said it's a decade, <laughs> um, he bought him a VHS tape that Monday. That's funny. And the young kids out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, look up VHS. <laughs> and I popped it in at home. And I thought, holy moly. People with disabilities in physical wheel, physical limitations in wheelchairs can do sport. Yeah. Uh, at the very end of the tape, it told me to contact somebody in Rhode Island who no longer has that office. I contacted him. He put me in contact with uh, one of our now high performance coach coaches, Michael McDevitt in Pennsylvania, and Michael really took me under his wing and showed me the way. Then in 1998, women started competing for the very first time internationally. So I was invited to my first international tournament to coach. And I'll be truthful with you, I was the assistant coach, but I think I was the band holder. <laughs> All I did was load, you rack. Get, you get an experience, yes. you're kind of learning. Yeah, sure. And absolutely. so from that, then I went on to Sydney. Um, the head coach injured himself three months out, and so that's how I got chosen to coach on that team. And again, I was the band holder as the assistant coach. But you watch and learn, and over time, I've picked up a lot. I've also become very friendly with the chairman of the IPC, International Paralympic Committee. 
Um, and so I was then able to learn from him and go under his wing. And between that and uh, our federation that we're trained under, to personal train, I've, that's really how my experience has come. Was there any like kind of um, maybe defining moment or just a situation, maybe, maybe it was with you know meeting that gentleman, seeing what he could do, that you decided that you really want to kind of specialize with working with athletes with disabilities or like, because obviously, you know, this is, seems to be like a big part of your life. It's, you're spent a lot of time and energy into it. So obviously it's something that you're really passionate about. Was there ever like kind of a key moment where you kind of decided that you really wanted to do this long term? And So um, truth be told, you took the line right from me. And I'm, I'm so, it makes, it makes me so happy that I came here today to talk to you yeah. because passion is the key. Yeah. Um, I think any of us, any of you watching will know if you're passionate about something, whether you can make money in it or not, if you love it, you're going to pursue it. Right. Um, I love coaching athletes with disabilities. It's amazing to sit back, help them, assist them, and sit back and watch them fulfill their dreams. Not everyone's going to be a Paralympian, just as not everyone's sure. going to be Olympian. We are on the same track, um, and it takes a lot. It takes a very special person personality, emotionally, physically, dedication beyond dedication to become a Paralympian and Olympian. But to see an athlete possibly make a world championship, to see them make a regional championship, to see them hit an MQS at a national is incredible. Um, and to know that I've had a small part in that or I've had a small part in training their coaches sure. to that is incredible. Part of the reason I'm happy to be with you, first of all, obviously seeing you and watching you through personal training classes and just seeing who you are ethically and your integrity is huge to me because that's huge for our sport, or any sport, but I can only talk about ours. Um, and then knowing that you're willing to take some of these athletes really far is amazing yeah. to me. Yeah, uh, I think there's like old saying, you know, it's like if you have a big enough why, you could, you'll eventually kind of figure out the how. And I think if you have a really strong reason, uh, if, if that passion is truly inside of you, you'll kind of figure out a way to make it work. Absolutely. Like you said in the beginning, you know, you were learning and you were kind of, but you were there and you were putting in the effort, you were putting in the time and making, I'm sure you made a lot of sacrifices. A lot of times you're getting on these long plane rides, maybe not going into the, the greatest, uh, you know, areas. Areas, areas, you know, sure. it's not like these are, all these areas are, uh, you know, vacation destinations, you know? <laughs> I mean, ultimately so. when it comes down to it, I have an office that I built in my house for the sport um, and I don't get paid a dime. And I work every night. I take three days off a year. So either you're committed or you're not. Yeah. But I'm committed to growing our sport, growing our coaches, our referees, and our athletes so that the U.S. can once again become um, on the podium and that other countries, many of the Middle Eastern countries, some of the Me Mexico and some of the South American countries are really dominant. I'd like the United States to be dominant. That's my goal for our athletes. I think that's a fantastic goal. And I know even for myself, uh, I think kind of echoing what you said, you know, just knowing you had a hand uh, in seeing these personal records, seeing these athletes, like, you know, whether it be a local meet or on a, on a big stage, like seeing them perform their best, uh, climb the ranks, get on a podium, uh, I know that's like really special to me. And, you know, it's, for a lot of these athletes, it's like, you know, you have that like little glimmer of success for that moment, but how many months and even potentially years Absolutely. it takes to get to that point and, all, and seeing all that time and effort like kind of pay off. Which is even having huge. Dave Page here a few weeks ago. Dave is a above, above the knee double amputee. Um, he was with us for last quad, which is a four year period. And in the Rio qualifier, he just didn't perform as well as he could. Very disappointing for him, disappointing for us. But we believe in him and we know he can yeah. do well. And here we are two years in and he's number seven in the world. It's amazing. So he climbed from below 25 to seven in a, a period of maybe two years. So sticking with it, and sometimes your time is when your time is. You know? Right. And I think uh, for, you know, as far as powerlifting is concerned, um, a lot of this, especially, you know, it's getting more popular, it's getting a little bit more exposure, and I know, like, a lot of people are not even aware of this offshoot of power powerlifting, and I think this could be a whole, you know, opportunity and just different avenue that a lot of these like, disabled athletes, these amputees can definitely take part in, so it's been cool. And I, I think one thing that's important to, uh, that you kind of talked about is kind of trusting the process, being patient. You talked about two years, four years, all this stuff, and a lot of times people, they want results like yesterday. So what are some of the things that you uh, try to uh, 
work with your athletes on a mental standpoint as far as like patience and putting in the work and like how long does it does this like going to really take for some of these? You know, I think it depends on the sport. Um, but in the end, you could be a four-year quad. We have an athlete, Jake Schrom. Um, he's currently now in. He was in '97. He's now in '107. Jake's been with us. This is his, I believe, third quad. And Jake slowly but surely has moved up. He had a real good shot at Rio, but he didn't make it either. Um, he was much closer than Dave, but it's really hard to be the top eight in the world. I mean, let, let's face it, top eight in the world is no joke. Sure. And so Jake is now with us for a third quad, and currently I think Jake is somewhere in the neighborhood of fourth in the world. So do I think he'll have a, get a slot to Tokyo? I'm pretty confident he will. We're two years out. We'll, we'll only see, um, but it could take it could take a four-year quad. So four years of training, eating right, giving up friends, you know, not going out with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your family members. Yeah. You know, at Thanksgiving, eating a smaller plate when everybody else is manjing. That's the dedication we're looking for. We as coaches are willing to dedicate ourselves and be passionate, and we're asking for our athletes to do the same. Yeah. So obviously, you know, going from like a recreational level to obviously this is you know. An Olympic sport right. it's a big commitment and uh, it's, so it's important so uh, maybe if someone uh, so can just I know you mentioned it a little bit but can you recap like who would, who would actually qualify uh, to be kind of eligible because I know there's some different requirements for certain so people. So anyone and with then, a physical disability yeah. in their lower body if you have a limb loss in your arms you cannot qualify unfortunately uh, for para sport that's probably more in the um, CrossFit world, they have divisions, but you must be able to also wrap your thumb around the bar. So even if you have full limb and limb use but can't do that, that would be an issue. Um, if you're only visually impaired and do not have a physical disability, you also don't qualify. Any other physical disability will qualify. There is a classification system. You cannot be more than 20 degrees of bend in your elbow. That's for the international rule, that's a safety rule. Have to wrap your thumb around the bar. Uh, so you have dwarfs, you have amputees, you have spinal cord injuries. Uh, those are probably um, polio. Those are probably the top four disabilities that are very competitive. That doesn't mean an athlete with cerebral palsy or any other physical disability sure. isn't going to be co not competitive. Let me go back to visually impaired. If you're visually impaired but have a physical disability, you then can compete. You cannot just have a, a blindness or visual impairment as a disability and compete. So I just want to be clear. I know, and then also I think, uh, and then you have to be able to obviously, you, as far as someone who's hearing impaired, you got to be able to hear the commands, right? So you really do need to because you cannot have someone with sign language. Um, now we have seen, we haven't had anyone in the U.S., but we've seen other athletes where the coach uh, on the competition day is it's not that far away. So if the referee shouts start and perhaps that athlete has some impairment in hearing, the coach then may shout start to ensure the athlete hears it because they're closer. Although not for nothing, the head ref is really sitting behind them. So, so they should, yeah, no, just curious. So I think it's important because some people might not, if people are listening, maybe you know somebody that could potentially qualify for this. Sure. Uh, for, and then, uh, you know, or maybe you're, maybe you have some sort of disability and so you're looking to go on this track. So that being said, for people that maybe, maybe they know of somebody or are somebody that would like to get involved, uh, in, in the actual competition aspect. Uh, so obviously we, we hosted a little camp here. Uh, so can you talk about like what would be the process of trying to get on the track to start competing? So for an athlete or a coach, uh, the first things you need to do are get on to disabled power lifting, all one word, dot com. On that website, we'll, we'll make sure that we add uh, the links in the description so you guys can check out that site awesome. as well. So. In that, that will link you to everything else the International Federation, which is IPC powerlifting.org. Um, those are where you will find the rules, but on disabledpowerlifting.com, there's links to all of that. You can also find myself and all the other high performance coaches on there. Um, and the process then, any athlete or prospective coach, prospective athlete or coach, needs to come to a level one training, what we hosted here at your gym. There we'll go over everything about the lift, everything about your nutrition, everything about um, any kind of supplement or drug use, which basically is you can't do, but we'll talk a little bit more in detail sure. about that. 
um, and we'll go through some basic assistive training, which is then not the bench press, but dumbbell work, uh, core work, TRX, any of those kind of machines that you may choose to use. Um, from that camp then, you should walk away with knowing what you need to do to start, where you need to go, how to find the standards to hit, to then go to your next tournament, hit your standards hopefully, to then qualify for the next level. So you start regionally within our country, then you come to a national, you would compete there within our country, then you'd come to an IPC certified event where you would get what we call classified. At that event, you have a national classifier that's looking at your disability to say, yes, you definitely pass. Once we've done that and the athlete has passed and hit all of their qualifiers, then you're on to your first international event. Great. So as far as I know, uh, you know, we, like Mary mentioned, we, we hosted our first camp here. I was uh, wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, we had spoke, you know, for those that don't know, like I used to, before I started doing uh, the business full time. Uh, when I was a personal trainer, I was still coaching wrestling and also uh, in the teaching field, working with uh, in special education. So I had a lot of uh, experience working with, like you know. Uh, students with cognitive disabilities but not so much with uh, physical disabilities but I know for me it was uh, definitely really cool uh, to see like actually how much these athletes can do right. and how independent a lot of them are and sure. uh, it was really cool and that was definitely something rewarding for me and uh, it definitely put a lot of things in perspective as well. And you see someone like Dave walk into your gym, right? So he's got mechanic, he has, he has prosthetic legs, he's really high up amputee, he always wears shorts so that people can see that he has mechanical legs and they don't bang into him, which will make him unsteady. So to see someone like that get out there and do what he did, that yeah. was probably pretty neat, right? Yeah, I know he was really excited to present and, and share his nice story job. and uh, he was showing some like assistance exercises that he does. And, and I think it's, you know, obviously, you know, myself or or, or you can obviously show people what to do, but to see like him in action, uh, like obviously you know watching him set up on the bench press, the tech, the technique, uh, even like his arch little things, like you know you could tell how how far he's come. Right. I could just see even just just meeting him that first day and seeing like all. Well, so it was it was a really cool thing, and I think it's it's good for those prospective athletes to see someone who's kind of been there and done that, and then maybe have that like. Because it's one thing to watch it on a video, but then another thing to see it in person Absolutely. and be like, oh, you know, maybe this is possible. Absolutely. And kind of having that belief. I know, like, for myself, uh, when I was climbing the ranks and I was a little bit more, you know, I still compete, but a little bit more, you know, focused on competing versus coaching now, uh, seeing, like, you know, those really big bench presses and squats and things and seeing, you know, that person, it definitely, like, kind of the light bulb turns on. You know, maybe I can do that too. Yeah. Maybe I, I, if I put in the time and the effort and I can work. Uh, that's great. So I know uh, for us here, uh, we're definitely going to be working together more and definitely putting more events on here. Great. And I know we also, you know, we had Caitlin on the podcast as well in Virginia. So she, she's been doing a great job of hosting uh, camps as well. So we're going to continue to kind of work on putting on more events, putting out more education. Um, Hopefully we'll have a regional here and then maybe moving on to a national. You never know. Yeah, we just got to get uh, get the equipment set right. up, but um, we're, we're working on that. All we're, in due we're time. Excited. Yeah, right. we're excited to... Uh... Speaking of equipment, can I just go back to that yes, really quickly? Yes, absolutely. Um, so for anyone that's watching and you say, well, how do I get this power bench? I don't have the money to buy an illegal bench, which is about $5,000. <laughs> you don't have to. If you go onto Disabled Powerlifting and you click on the equipment link, there will be a, what we call an overlay that you can build to an AB or an able-bodied bench. Um, approximately $60. Basically, you need 4 by 4s um, and you need Naga hide or some sort of material that's not material uh, to put over it to lay on. Um, so for about $60 to $100, you can build an overlay that you can then start training. The specs are on there and there's a video that will teach you how to do it. Cool. Uh, I know you also talked about a little bit of, uh, you know, since this is under like kind of the Olympic umbrella, uh, some drug testing supplements and stuff. Um, what are some things, if someone is looking to get into the sport, what are some things that people should kind of watch out for or just be aware of if they want to kind of get on this track and make sure they're kind of following all the rules and upholding the standards? So, of the sport? in the end of the day, what the USOC, the United States Olympic Committee, and the United States Paralympic Committee, which are brother and sister, um, what we have to follow and are mandated to tell all of you is no supplement is FDA regulated, Food and Drug Administration regulated. So because of that, we do not approve anyone taking any kind of supplement. As a, as a lifter, body lifter, trainer, power lifter, the first thing that comes to anybody's mind is whey. Whey sure, protein. Just like a basic protein um, powder. Right? We yeah. have a nutritionist on staff that will help you with your protein intake. Um, and there are some things that have been tested 
and are definitely clear, which I today can't say, uh, but when you come to a camp, you'll hear. Um, but basically, any supplement is enough. Um, if you eat properly, you can get pretty much what you need. Sure. Um, after that, in relation to any kind of medication that you're taking, you could go onto USADA, United States Anti-Doping. Um, yes, those are the same people that brought Aunt, uh, Lance Armstrong down. You can go onto their website, and anyone can access that and find out what, if they're taking a medication, you can type it in, and it will tell you if it's approved, approved within the country, approved for competition, approved outside of the country. And just to my understanding, for people watching, like people are like, well, why can't I take a protein powder? It, there is potential that even if it is, like say, a clean, a clean substance, it might be cross-contaminated. It might be like I'm done on a factory with a banned substance, maybe a little correct. trace particles get correct. involved. Is that correct? Is that correct? That's absolutely right. So you just kind of sometimes you just don't really know since it is a kind of like a highly unregulated field. You get these propri proprietary blends. You don't right. really know how much of the ingredients you're getting in. So it's just something to be kind of aware if you are on a on an Olympic track. If you're just obviously lifting recreationally, and you know that's kind of a different story. But if you do want to get on the Power Olympic team, these are important kind yes. of things to know. Or Olympic track, any yeah. any any sport that's governed by USOC and US Paralympics is every coach will tell you the same thing: supplements are enough. And, and, and for like kind of some of the able body lifters that are competing in like the, the USAPL, uh, which is obviously a, you know a drug drug tested federation as well, they have very similar rules, kind of following those you know. Uh, USADA, WADA, and all these like different guidelines. So obviously, you know, check, uh, you know, check with your check with your, you know, check your rule book and everything. But uh, it's always better to kind of be safe Absolutely. and kind of know what you're putting. In. And then you just want to know what you're putting in your body. Like exactly, anyway, I think that's important. And once so. you come to one of our camps, all of our coaches and athletes will start getting what's called Smart Bites, which is written by one of the dietitians at the USOC. They put it out weekly, and so it's summer. People want to drink smoothies. There's a healthy way to drink smoothies without putting whey protein, with still getting protein still in it. And so nutrition. they send yeah. actually every week they send a recipe um, of healthy things that our athletes, coaches, trainers can make that then you'll have no compromise knowing what our athletes, no matter what sport they're in, are looking for. And speaking about the nutritionist, I know there were when we talked about the camp, if you want to maybe, if, if you'd like, uh, talk about maybe some of the perks or some of the things that you do for your athletes to help them, because obviously maybe, uh, maybe financially it's kind of hard to travel and things mm -hmm. like that. So what are some of the things that uh, that your that you get for your team, and where some of the kind of so we have a sports psychologist, um, and usually when I say that, people think, oh my goodness, you know, they want me to see a shrink. No, she's not a shrink. Her name is Dr. Jessie Stapleton. She's a sports psychologist. She's phenomenal at what she does, and her role is to help our athletes get over any of those misgivings that they might have when, upon their approach when they're on the bench or afterward, or any anxiety and such sure. like that. Uh, we have a nutritionist on staff, we have the ability for DEXA scans, a DEXA scan can be great for an athlete. They come in, they see exactly how much body fat they have and what's going on, then they work with our nutritionist and then they come back in six months, get another scan and they see how successful they've been. Um, so we've got sports psych. That could be really helpful for us figuring out like what optimal weight class maybe you want to be. Exactly. Like that. And that could obviously make it the difference between maybe making the team and, and not, or not potentially. Uh -huh. so. Diet is a major piece of it. Um, then of course you have the high performance coaches, you have access to that. I do video review personally as the high performance manager every other month. An athlete has to send me a video. Um, it has to be a competition style video. So all I'm looking at is their technique. It does not have to be uh, max. So it's really where they are in their training. So I follow them as they go. Yeah. I have every video from every really, athlete. Really working the, the actual skill and making sure the exactly. standard of the lift is going to get white light. So when they, they get, that's exactly right. When they get to their first international tournament, the first one is the hardest. You've gone through classification, which is stressful, and now it's your first time in this big arena. You want to be prepared, and I'm tough on our athletes because I'd rather them have it tough before they high, leave our country. High standard, and they're and guess what? Yeah. Maybe someone else internationally might let something slip, but at least that athlete is prepared. Sure. Um, so those are four or five of the things, and there's a, a host of others that I can't think of off the top of my head, but those are four no, or five just, of the things. I just want to kind of cover our bases. So I want to just kind of harp on a couple of things. I think this is important no matter what sport you're in. Uh, if you hold yourself to a high standard in training, it's kind of like, you know, they say hard training, easy combat, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, if, you're, if you're really strict with your pausing, your commands, you're getting the commands in, in training, practice how you play, when you get to the meet, it's going to be a lot easier. If you're kind of bobbling a little bit on your chest, maybe a little bounce, maybe you're not really quite stopping it, 
you're kind of gambling a little bit. It's going to be hard to pick your openers. It's going to be hard to pick your attempts. And you'd rather kind of be safe than start, sorry. And you could always kind of open light and kind of go up and make sure you're hitting a good standard. So I think that's great. I think the video review is something really powerful. You know, before we had, like we talked about the VHS, we, you know, everyone's got like smartphones and stuff now. So record your lifts, watch it. And then how it looks, sometimes it's two different Absolutely. things. And obviously as you get more advanced, you get a better feel. Uh, you get a little bit more in tune with your body. Uh, the other thing I wanted to kind of also, you said like, oh, you know, because I think there is definitely still a, st a stigma. It's getting better, but there is a little bit of stigma of maybe getting therapy or seeing a psychologist and things like that. And I know for myself, uh, I actually was dealing with a little bit of a, a lower back tweak uh, a couple of years ago and I was getting ready for a contest and I wasn't sure if I was going to be ready to do it. And uh, I remember one of my buddies, he's actually over here, Vinny Desenzo, uh, actually really fantastic bencher. He uh, benched over 600. Uh, wow. Raw in three different weight classes. Ooh. So he really accomplished bencher. Um, also did some equipped lifting. He benched 900 in a shirt. But anyway, Vinny always talked about um, how important the mental side of training is. And I think a lot, if you ask anyone, people would say like, "Oh, how, how is the, the mental side important?" Everyone would say yes. How much time are you spending working on your mental game? Amen. And it's there usually, you go. usually, That's exactly usually right. the answer is zero. That's so exactly I think right. that um, the sports psychologist especially if you have performance anxiety. Some people might be like all rock stars in the gym and then they get to the meet and then they kind of fall apart. Exactly. So I think the mental, so that's, I think that's a huge perk. You have to train that piece as well because you have to be prepared for when you're in that warm up world, all those other countries trying to intimidate you. Are you a lot of things out of your control. Intimidating yep. yourself. What's going on in that warm up that could change and not be what you wanted yep. it to be. But if you've prepared yourself mentally, you can block it all out and be focused on one thing, which is those three lifts, the end. Yeah, so I think the mental game is, is big, and we actually have some re, you know resources on, on that as well, which uh, we'll include in the links. But uh, so that that's a big thing I just want to kind of harp on as well. So uh, I think this has been great. I want to start to wrap up a little bit. So let's say maybe you're an athlete, maybe you're you want to potentially coach, maybe you want to help out at one of the events. If someone wants to get involved in power powerlifting, whether like I said, it be someone helping or actually competing. Uh, what, what, what advice would you give them and like where, where, where would they start? They so the advice involved. I would give them is they should review the Disabled Powerlifting website. Everything they need to know is there and there's also a lot, some video so then they can kind of see really what they're getting involved in at whatever level it is, whether it's even a referee. Then after that, you'll be able in the contacts to find me. If you're looking to referee, I'm going to send you to our head referee, Stella Herrick, or her son, Richard, Rick Herrick. If you're looking to coach, you're going to stay with me, obviously, and my head coach, which is John Skovinak. If you're looking to be an athlete, I'm going to send you to one of our assistant coaches, who is a four-time Paralympic athlete, Mary Stack. She's going to guide you and give you guidance into how to get to a regional event, how to get to a level one, so on and so forth. And, that's, and, and eat well, take care of your mental, yeah. get to the gym don't only bench press and you'll do all right as far as an athlete. Great. Um, oh man. I think that's pretty good. Uh, is there any, like, I guess advice to maybe someone who's like maybe a little nervous or on the fence about trying this? Like what, what, what kind of advice would you tell someone if maybe they're just kind of... I would say try it. You, you know, kind of like the commercial, you don't know till you try. You don't know till you try. Um, yeah. You're not going to come out of the box and lift 600 pounds and be able to stop in your chest. <laughs> There's no one that's going to be able to do that. If you're benching right now with your legs down on the ground and you're benching it's be a 400, adjustment, yeah. yes, your bench is going to drop, but you'll get back there. So try it. Get to a gym. Just put your legs up on an able body bench. Try it. See what you think. You're going to find you're using a lot more of your back. You're going to find you're going to need to work the back of your back, all of those muscles. Try it. And then give us an email. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's good to just just take that first step. Uh, you know, definitely check out the website. Jeff, definitely check out the web links. Um, again, one of the things that you know we talked about this podcast is called Powerlifting for the People, and one of the reasons why I think we connected so well and why I'm excited to get involved more in the power community, uh, it's really like showcasing these athletes with disabilities and seeing like really what's capable. Right. It's really amazing and it's, it just kind of shows that like no matter who you are and what your disability is, you do possess the ability to get stronger. Maybe not everyone can, can be an Olympian, but you do possess the ability to get stronger, get better, and this is a very viable option for competition in order to kind of improve yourself and just kind of be the strongest and best and version of yourself. And I will say you, our competitive athletes, our national team, we have 14 athletes currently, they don't see themselves as a disability when they're on that bench. They're benching, they're strong, and they're competing. Yeah. Because this is a competitive sport, like all the yeah. other uh, 22 Paralympic sports. And it is about getting out there and competing and representing the United States of America. 
Um, and that is something that is an amazing feeling. When you walk yeah, out to a John. stadium yeah. and there's 100,000 people in the stadium and you look up and you see the American flags at the Paralympics or at World Championships, there's no feeling like that, to me anyhow. Yeah, I think it's an honor and not everyone, like I said, gets the chance to represent their country. So uh, it's definitely a, a, an amazing feeling no matter if you're able-bodied or not. So I think that's really cool. So if you do want to get involved in power, power lifting, whether you be an athlete, coach, referee, or you just want to help out, so you can check out the links below, check out disabled power lifting. Um, you know, Mary, we're fortunate enough to have Mary, we happen to be very close to each other, so she's out right Long Island, which is awesome. So definitely stay tuned for more events in the future. Uh, if this interview helped you, or if maybe there's someone that you, that you think would be good, good fit for uh, competing or getting involved, definitely share the interview, give the podcast a five-star review. It helps other people find us. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, stay strong, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody.